Valerie Biden Owens is the chair of the Biden Institute at the University of Delaware, a partner at Owens Patrick Leadership Seminars, a board member of the Ministry of Caring, and formerly served on the National Board of the Women's Leadership Forum of the Democratic National Committee. The younger sister of President Joe Biden, she led his seven consecutive successful campaigns for the U.S. Senate, was campaign manager for his presidential bids in 1988 and 2008, and was his principal campaign trail representative and a senior advisor for his 2020 bid for the White House. In her new memoir, she shares stories of her close-knit family and being a confidant and advocate in her brother's life and career. A reviewer for The Guardian calls it a moving portrait of sibling love. This evening, she will be joined in conversation with Marjorie Margulies, President, Women's Campaign International, and author of And How Are the Children? Timeless Lessons from the Front Lines of Motherhood. Please join me in welcoming our guests to the Free Library. I'm, I'm a card-carrying fan of Valerie's, and we've known each other for way too long, don't you think? Not long enough. <laughs> still, we have miles to go still. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I want to tell you, and we'll get into this a bit, one of the things that has made me a huge fan of Valerie's, I, I run an organization called Women's Campaign International, which was just mentioned, and Valerie is one of our trainers. Besides the fact she's a hoot and a howl, um, she, everybody adores her. So we're going to get into some of the trainings because she's really good at it. Um, but why don't we just start out by... Uh, how did you pick the, the title for the book? I mean, I know that it, 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 there could have been, it could have been Val. Um, but Growing Up Biden, is such, it, it's, it's really a perfect title for, for what, what you have done here. Um, I, don't know how to, I don't know how to answer that. Uh, that is, that's not a trick question. Um, growing Up Biden. Uh, the, the book, uh, most of the stories in the book, I have already, had already written. You know, when some people get uh, uh, excited or anxious or concerned or happy, you know, they, and they have a lot of energy, you, you might go out and run a marathon or, you know, play the piano or create a piece of art. Well, I write, and I'm a storyteller. So the nuns in my Catholic school education <laughs> said, Miss Biden, it is much harder to write a 500-word uh, composition than it is a three-page composition because you have to get your thoughts in order and, and, you know, be succinct. So I would spend, I have lit literally a Biden word, um, hundreds of vignettes and short stories that I've written. And I think that the... I think that the, the, the moral, the reason, the reason I wrote, and not to be a, a smarty, uh, is I wrote <coughs> for, um, I wrote for myself. And my kid said, Mom, these stories are really good. And why don't you put them in a book? And I said, who cares? You know, that I rode on the bike with Joey, you know, like Uncle Joe. Who, you know, who cares? And then my children said, Mommy, we care and our grandchildren care. So put them together in a book about what it was like growing up Biden. And I expect that, suspect that it's like many of your families. Uh, the, the book is about the magic of family. And true, my family is a little different right now because <laughs> yes. my brother's president. But we all have our stories. And I think that the that the threads that weave the fabric of family together, which are commitment and loyalty and love and heartbreak and disappointment and loss, they're the same threads, I bet, that run through each of your families. You know, we, we all have our stories. And I think to the extent that we can relate to each other, um, we'll all be a little bit better off. Empathy is a word that is a high flutin word and it just means to absorb or to feel. And it's the connective tissue in humanity. 
So what I would think, the next question that usually comes with this is, what do you want, what do you want people to take from it? Uh, I don't, uh, and again, it sounds like a smart ass, I don't care what you take from it. I mean, I wrote the book because there, there are stories, but what I would like, what would make me feel like I'm a real live author, is if when you read the book and you put it down and you said, God, she gets me, or that's my dad. You know, that, that that, that's my brother. That reminds me of my family. And again, my family was mid 20th century Irish Catholic middle class family from Wilmington, Delaware. Three brothers and mom and dad and me. But that's the, the moral of my story is maybe, maybe you'll see something in it that makes you smile or, you know, there's sad stuff, all, all stories have some magic in them, but I couldn't write a book about growing up Biden and butterflies and lollipops and la la la, and isn't it wonderful? Because no family's like that. There's a lot of, a lot of good and bad that happens to every family. Was that and a long-winded Biden that answer? That was a very <laughs> long-winded answer, but it was okay, it was good. It Thank was you. a good, solid answer. Um, but Joe will say she's the writer. And, and it's, it's very true. I mean, the, the, through the, all these campaigns and everything, a lot of the writing fell in, on your desk. And they would say, Val, how does this flow? Um, it, not anymore. But <coughs> no, still. Uh, uh, <laughs> but um, but, but what the, my, my brother's an excellent writer. And uh, uh, but what, what we try to do, you know, you get, you speak, I mean, lawyer, you speak legalese, or you're, you're social workers, or <clears throat> whatever it is, you've got your own codes and abbreviations, and Joe and I are both from the, cut from the same cloth. For Christ's sakes, will you just say it in English? Not as opposed to Spanish or, uh, or another language, but just say, say, just yes. say what you mean um, in ordinary words that ordinary people, you know, understand. Not dumb it down. But, you know, ordinary people can do extraordinary things. Just tell me what it is, and then let me move. So that's, I'm Joe's echo, you know. Did Val, he'll say, Val. Joe's a sound, yeah. yeah did, or do you understand what they just said? And I said, <laughs> Joe, this is during the debates. Joe, if you said that, you know, I would vote for the other candidate. <laughs> <You know? clears throat> so that's. That's still, that's my role. Let, let's back up a bit. In 1970, <laughs> first, well, you had been, you had worked with Joe on his sixth grade campaign, on all of his campaigns when he, but 1970 was the first real campaign, correct? Yeah, that was, that was for county council, and it was in a, in a Republican district where um, we were not expected to win but we were supposed to try on our training wheels. And it was about the development that, that was happening. There were a lot of high, Delaware is a corporate capital of the world, quote unquote, but there was a lot of development and a lot of the roads and the development were going through the, the blue collar neighborhoods, but not the wealthy neighborhood. We have an enclave of some very wealthy people in Delaware. And so Joe got involved mostly because of development and because of the oil refineries that were on the Delaware River. And we were one of the very first campaigns to ever talk about the environment. And that's when we went for Senate in 1972. So we ran in, in 70, we won, and they redistricted, and we had to go up again in 1970, and two years later, to either run again for county council or go for the U.S. Senate. So you pick, because quite, they quite told a us difference. they yeah. told us we were going to lose either way. I mean, Joe's the first senator that he and I ever met. And that's the honest to God truth. So they said, you know, they're, let 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 the kid go. He was twenty nine. I was twenty six, and they said, yeah, let him go. You know, he'll fall off the face of the earth, and then we can go on with business. But uh, but we didn't fall off. But it set the stage for your being one of the very few women who, who ran a, a presidential campaign. Yes, I am the first, I'm told, uh, that I'm the first woman to have run a modern U.S. Senate campaign, and I ran seven in a row, and the first to have run a presidential campaign. 
And that is not because um, I am a, have a PhD in political science or campaign management. Uh, it's the reason that I, I, my candidate was my brother and I have a PhD in Joe Biden. <laughs> so I was the logical person and, um, and I can, we, we grew up, um, he's three years older than I, I mean, I still won't forgive him for exposing that in his book because <laughs> up until that point, he was 10 years older than I. <clears throat> but uh, we've been best friends our entire life. My mother said there was family, there's family, and then there's family. And you know that with you, your kids. And so we would... You would uh, also tell them, it, Joe would always make sure that you were included, which was... Just so lovely. I mean, he uh, from the from the honest to God from the time I opened my eyes, my earliest memories are of my brother putting out his hand and saying, "Come on, Val, let's go. We've got things to do, places to go, and people to see." <laughs> and he took me with him every place he went. And his friends would say, "Why did you bring a girl?" And he said, "She's not a girl. She's my sister." <laughs> and he told me that whatever he could do, he said I could do better. He said, you're smarter than I am. You're, you're a nicer person than I am. You're kinder, whatever it was. And that was impossible. I mean, he was three years on five. He's eight. There's a big difference in the, those three years. But I knew that I owed it to him and to myself to try to be that little girl or that big girl that he thought I could be. So he gave me a great deal of confidence. And confidence, I think, is the number one prerequisite for success in life. And my brothers gave it to me. And when we walked out the door, my mother said to us, um, you walk out that door, you sh shut the door behind you, and, and just remember, you're Bidens. Not as, as opposed to being Rockefellers or Kennedys or whoever's in quote unquote important people. We were Bidens. We were four kids, and we had, e we had each other's back. That w we walked out that door, that was it, and that's what we've uh, tried to do. You ran seven mm -hmm. Senate campaigns. You ran three presidential campaigns, and 1972 was your favorite. Why? Because uh, we didn't know what we didn't know, <laughs> and that was a very good thing. Um, really and truly, the, it was 1972, remember, was Nixon landslide over uh, George McGovern. Delaware is a Republican state. It was still segregated. Uh, we've got a 29-year-old who was too young to be elected when the election was November 7th. He had to wait till November 20th till he would be legal to be 30 years old that he could accept the office. We knew no one in power. We had no influence. There was no structured Democratic Party, which is why they said let the kid go. But we had energy, we had enthusiasm. And in 1972, that was a time then there was a combustible relationship between youth and the issues. And the issues were stopping the war in Vietnam, protecting civil rights, and protecting planet Earth. And it was also the first year that 18-year-olds could vote. So they had skin in the game. So it was, and they had brothers and sisters who were in college who were, you know, protesting. So they wanted to, my, I was a teacher at Wilmington Friends, and I taught upper school, and I told my kids, uh, which they, I would be fired for today, but if they didn't work in the campaign, I would flunk them. <laughs> <laughs> and they weren't really, but I put it in a more positive way. <laughs> I said, you know, we can learn about political science, because I taught all the social science courses, or we can, we can learn about it or we can practice it. So again, we had nobody to tell us what to do or not to do because nobody took us seriously. Those kids made all, we didn't have money for posters, so the kids after school came to the headquarters and we, all of our posters were hand painted. So when the, and and one of the one of my students created our logo and made our pins and the press called us the children's crusade and it became the thing the place to be not for you know the 
the the the nerdy kind of people you know, who just go in and the library. But it was that person, and it was the cheerleader, and it was the captain of the football team. It was the president of the class. They all came, and they just and it snowballed from one school to another. And lastly, in this, what when we hand delivered Labor Day weekend before the November election, six weeks. We, again, we had no money for glossy brochures or for stamps. Uh, we hand delivered 150,000 pieces of literature throughout to almost every home in the state. And it was these kids got up at six o'clock in the morning. They did it till 10 o'clock when they played their football game and then they go back and do it again. And we parents think that we influence our children which we do, but children influence parents a whole lot more. And when these parents, who would no sooner have voted for a Democrat than they would have had for, for Mickey Mouse, <laughs> when they saw their daughter, Janie, or their son, Tommy, get out of bed for this guy, Biden, they said, you know, I better take, it, I better take another look. There's something going on here. And we won by 3,163 votes. <laughs> and it's remember. those Republican parents, I think, I mean, who, who the, the regular coalition of labor people or good government people were there as, anyway. But to get us those 3,160 to pull us over, I think it was those parents. So the, we, were, we were dubbed the Children's Crusade. Everything was brand new. We didn't, again, we didn't know enough what not to know. So we. You know, you know, when you're, if you have too much information, you're kind of afraid. And we didn't, you know, we just had to create on the spot, and we improvised, and um, and we loved, and we had the best candidate. I forgot to mention that. <laughs> you know, he wasn't bad. <clears throat> and then the world fell apart. Yes. Um, and I mean, we've discussed this a lot because. <clears throat> Excuse um, me. <clears throat> you know, losing a, a, a child or losing, in, in this case, it was a sister-in-law. Sister um, th throughout your life, your career, this is, you've just had to deal with this, and there isn't really any answer for it. Um, you know, it, you, just, um, you, you, you just kind of figure out how you deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. And why don't you do tell and talk well, what about what we're talking about is that we were elected on November seventh, nineteen seventy two. Uh, at that time, we were told we were the youngest senator ever elected. I think we were the sixth, but you know, the the headlines: youngest guy in the in the nation elected. December eighteenth, Joe and I were in Washington, picking his staff, which is a, to, which is a whole other area that we should talk about, but. Um, yeah, because you know he was like this one, this wonder boy, and we had st literally stacks and stacks of resumes of young people who wanted old people who wanted young and old people who wanted to work for us. Senate was in recess. Senator Byrd said you could use my his office. So Joe and I went down that morning and we began interviewing staff. Um, my brother Jimmy Biden called. And uh, you remember, there's no cell phones or anything at this time. We called Senator Byrd's office and said, Valerie, come home now. And, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Neilia was in the station wagon. They have three children. Uh, Bo, who was three, uh, Hunter, who was two, and the baby daughter, whose name was Naomi, but the boys called her Caspi. Be, uh, I thought it was Amy. It is, but the boys called her. Cat. Oh, she had okay. three names. She was baptized Naomi, oh, yeah. Christina. And then to the world, she was Amy. <laughs> but the boys, because she was due around Halloween, called her. She was born right after November uh, Halloween, and they called her Caspi. So Joe, <laughs> Neil, yeah, we called her. The family called her Caspi. Anyway, um, they went and picked up the Christmas tree, and they were on their way home. They were hit broadside by a tractor trailer. Nelia and the baby were immediately killed, and Bo and Hunter were thrown through eternity in the car and were very seriously injured, and ended up in the hospital for quite some time. Uh, so, 
Jimmy Biden said, come home. And I said, okay. And my brother looked at me and I, I said, well, you know, was, we got to go. And he looked at me and he said, I, I tell it in, in the book. Um, he said, um, sh she's dead, isn't she? And I didn't, I couldn't tell him. But all he had to do was look at me, you know, in that language of brothers and sisters or people that you know. And we came home, and um, it was a, uh, I, I said to my brother, nothing heroic, exactly what my brothers would have said to me if it had been reversed. I said, um, I'll come in, and I'll move in, and I'll stay until it's time to go. Because he said, uh, I can't go. I, you know, I can't go to. I can't go to war. I'm not going to Washington. He told, he told Jimmy Biden to call the governor, and say um, that he would I'm not accept. Down. He yeah. was stepping down and to appoint someone, because the, the headline saying the uh, newly elected Senator Biden said Delaware can get another senator, but the boys cannot get another father. And Joe said, I just don't know how we can make it work. And I said, we can, you know, we'll make it work. And he, I never wanted to be ma, I never could replace mommy, that was Nelia. And I never wanted to be mom because I, Joe was 29. I wanted his heart to be open to fall in love and have a life again. He had just turned 30. So I was Aunt Val, which I've always been, but I was Aunt Val in, a, in the mom. Role. But you really stepped up to the plate. You, I mean, you took over. Yeah, I, and five years later, he met Jill, and he and he married Jill. But they were my boys. Um, uh, I I tell Joe and the the lighter side, you know, they were my training wheels, so I could have three <laughs> perfect children. I, I could screw that. She screw does those have guys amazing up, children. I uh, so I I moved in until it was. It, until it was time to go. And it was a wonderful, it was a tragic time, but it was also a wonderful time of healing and uh, of coming together. And the boys, um, you know, you have to have a purpose. My, my brother got up every morning because of the boys. He had to be strong, you know, daddy's here. And uh, so the, and the senators in Washington were wonderful to Joe both sides of the aisle, and said, come down, Joe, try it just for six months, see if it works. And so, because Joe said, I can't move the kids to Washington, because then we leave my mom and dad and Uncle Jimmy and Uncle Frankie and Aunt Val. So Joe commuted. That's how come we started Amtrak Joe. But first, it was the, the car. He, for, for two years, he went by car and then by the train. But they were also magical times. Uh, with the, my brother gave me a tremendous gift by letting letting me come in and. What's your relationship boys. with him like now? With Joe, mm -hmm. the same. He's my brother. I mean, he happens to be present, but that makes me first sister for Christ's sake. So. <laughs> How often does he call? A lot. We we, nothing. You know, nothing change. He's that's his job. His job is to be, and it's a really, you know, it weighs heavily. It, you know, it's a responsible. I you mean, think? I, but yeah, <laughs> but uh, but we 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 talk all, all the time. time. I I came back. I was in Greece last week on a business with the University of Delaware, and we landed in. It was two days ago. We landed in Munich, and as we land in Munich, there's Air Force One. <laughs> And when I got off the plane, I texted him and said, hey, Joe, ship's passing in the night. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm here. Where, where the hell are you? Of course, he was... Did you his, see him at all? No, no. I We just boarded oh, we another were, yeah. plane, but he was there. He's been there this week. Yeah, but uh, you you helped him pick... Your, pick. You have one area in the book where you, where you disagreed with one of his choices, Wes, when when he was when he was picking a staff, and well, Wes I agreed with, but the other one I didn't. He oh, was okay. a real turkey. <laughs> but, but <laughs> I do have a little opinion. <laughs> uh, yes, 
I would say. I he would wasn't say, a turkey. That was that's not fair. What you mean in the seventy-two? Yeah, 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 yeah. So we're this is before Neilia died. This is immediately after the election, and we're in Joe and Neilia's home and the dining room table, and and we're doing the locals. We're doing staff, and there was one guy, Wes Bartham, a spectacular man that Senator Church had lent us during the campaign and uh, to help us at the very end of the campaign. And Senator Church decided, we, I'm not Senator, said that Wes Bartham was, we could, he would give up to have he, Joe. The, you could borrow the, him, the yeah. New, yeah. the new young guy, and he would, until he got his sea legs. But then we needed a Delaware director. And my brother Joe said, I'm gonna, uh, I thought I would ha ask, I'm calling them Reds. Just make up a name, a Rob, or I don't, I don't know, whatever name I named him in the book, because I didn't want to, you know, say anything bad about a particular person. Um, so Joe said he was going to have Rob or whatever his name is, and I said, I remember sitting across the dining room table, and I said, Rob, Rob, you're going to have Rob for our Delaware director? He said, Yeah, he's a good guy, he's smart, he's helped us, he's done. You have a problem with Rob? Yeah. I have a problem with Rob. What stinks? The, yeah. <laughs> What's the problem with Rob? I said, he's he's old school. He's not you. You know, he's a good. He, he wasn't a bad guy, but he's not a Biden guy. He's not like you. He's not the future. And it's it's not right. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I I don't think you ought to do it. Well, you know, I I think it's probably my choice, Valerie. You know. And I said, oh, okay. Not okay, Joe. I don't think this is good. Anyway, <laughs> back and forth. So he's mad, but he, you know, he can't yell or scream or hit me because I'm his sister. And uh, he ends up pacing around the living room, which is the dining room, which is not. Too, he just comes back, sits down again. So he said, "So uh, who do you, who do you think should be, you know, smart ass?" And I said, "Ted Kaufman." He said, "Who the hell is Ted Kaufman?" I said he's a guy who has helped in the campaign and you know in middle management on his way up in the Dupont company and explained who Ted Kaufman. Ted Kaufman, yeah, Ted Kaufman. Forever he was there. Uh, do you have do, do you have Ted Kaufman's number? I said yeah, I do. <laughs> he goes to the wall phone in the kitchen, calls uh, Ted Kaufman, please. This is Joe Biden. Uh, would you be my Delaware State Director? <laughs> and Ted Kaufman said, uh, I would be, Senator, don't you think that we should meet first and talk? <laughs> and, and Joe said, no, my sister said you should be the <laughs> Delaware State Director, so we'll talk later. And he was fabulous. And I he mean, stayed for 23 years. Yeah, forever. And then he became Chief yeah. of Staff in, in He's Washington. He's just fabulous. Just a wonderful, the, the other guy wasn't bad. It just wasn't a guy like Ted Kaufman. I have a tons of questions, but I, I do want to take you to to our what we did and 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 the kinds of things you said to women around the world <coughs> with regard to Women's Campaign International is an organization that excuse that, me, <coughs> it's allergies. I'm not sick. I'm allergy. <laughs> um, and this is vodka. <laughs> <laughs> um, Following the, the Fourth World Conference, WCI, Women's Campaign International, was formed, was, b b we, was born, um, and Valerie has been one of our trainers, and she's terrific. And as we travel around the world, some of the gems that you leave with women are, um, I mean, just having to do with feel, you know, feel the audience, get out. And one of the things that you do, which is, would you would you explain the frame? I just love that when you when you talk to women about. Oh, <coughs> I am a. Uh, it sounds like voodoo, but I am a, a body language a certified body language expert. So I've been tracking all of you. You know, <laughs> just uh, you know, i mean, I know the signs, and <coughs> one of the things I that we, she took me all over the world with her, I think like 20 different countries and a lot, lot of uh, places. A lot, uh, as a volunteer. And the women, uh, they're, the, the major thing that they're lacking is confidence. I mean, but these are women in Liberia on the back of motorcycles and dusty, you know, we stayed in concrete block 
hotels <laughs> with men on either end of it with Uzis. Uh, the so, UN was protecting us. You know, it was not like this was a really ritzy outfit. I mean, we But were, she was still the best dressed. <laughs> but, I mean, this was boots on, she's boots on the ground. I mean, really training right in there with, with the women. Anyway, <clears throat> I would, one, one of the things that she's talking about is framing yourself and what I do at school or any place I, I go with women. When you walk into the room, picture yourself, all of you, we're all professional women, all right? This is what I tell you. We're all, and you're all supposed to go to this conference. And you don't know anybody. Let's make the whole scene. Your husband's home. He's ticked. He's got three kids at home. <laughs> You're going to be gone for four days. What the hell do you have? What did you put food in the freezer? You know, all this stuff. I'm making worst case scenarios. And you go and you don't want to be there and you walk into the room and this whole room is filled with people who are from different parts and they're all having fun. They're all in groups from their, you know, from their organization and you are by yourself. So what do you do? And you can walk in the room. I have, you want me to do this, really? Yeah. See? <laughs> OK, so here. Which one do you think? This is about building confidence. Which one do you think is the more confident woman? <laughs> Bar's over there. <laughs> and I head for the bar. Not because I need a drink. But I have to look purposeful. You know, I. We're okay. Oh, do you, will you bring me a drink? Do you need a drink? And, or the woman who walks in, and I said, so that's, uh, there's no confidence. So now walk in the room, and I look around, and I see groups of people who are having fun. And I walk up to the group who are laughing, and I said, walk up and say, hi. I'm Valerie by no means. May I join your group? Sure. That's it. I'm there, I'm in. Now don't be a dummy and pick the one who was fighting. Like, you know, <laughs> they're really having a problem. May I join your group? No. <laughs> not. But it's so simple. It was, and what you want to do is always, and this is in real life, frame yourself. You know how you frame pictures of your, your graduation diploma, your wedding, your baby, you know, your, everything's in a frame? Put yourself between two objects, like two trees, two vases, two chairs. That's why everybody, when you, you see pictures being taken, it's the one who gets in the middle. Look at the woman who's going to go right around to the beginning of the, hi, I'm back, you know, and the <laughs> other pillar. It's the one in the middle who is deemed, I don't know why, but that's considered the most important person, just subconsciously. So put yourself in the middle of the picture and um, and we had such fun with it. Anyway, with they're Valerie. the kinds of things. We did exercises like that. And we had uh, play acting. And the other big deal is how to shake hands. You give that fish hand, I chop it off. <laughs> um, okay, I have the, I, I, you're going to tell one quick story about how, um, how you and Jack finally decided <laughs> that you were not going to hate each other anymore. Uh, Jack is my husband of, will be 47 years in October. And do you know, he was really S-L-O-W. I mean, he met me, and he didn't fall in love with me. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Ten he years was later, he asked me Joe's to marry him. One of Joe's best friends, though. He was, one of, he was my brother's best friend. My brother was in law school. They both started the first year at Syracuse. They met the first day. And my brother told Jack that he had just the person for him. And, you know, my brother, when he gets going, it's ad nauseum. Like, she's the most wonderful. This, this, and, and, and guess what, Jack? She's coming up next weekend. I'm going to let you go out with her. And Jack said, oh, yeah, Christ, I can't wait, you know? <laughs> and <clears throat> anyway, he didn't, I don't know why he didn't appreciate me. I said, hi, Jack. I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> took, took, took him a while. Took him Ten a while. years to later to the weekend, we got married. But it's, it certainly wasn't my fault. <laughs> but this is, this is a perfect question to follow up what you are saying. How does a young man find someone like you, smart, ambitious, charming, stunning, when you were 25? What do you mean when I was, how about now? Yeah, I know. <laughs> what, I, I was only that way when I was 25? I'm, I'm just reading <laughs> Who the Who wrote that? <laughs> 
Did you write that? <laughs> you are not a Rhodes Scholar if you wrote that. <laughs> He's applying for a Rhodes Scholarship. Um, what was the best victory party you've attended, and uh, and why? P this is political. You mean victory party? Uh, okay. I don't. I I guess. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, the first campaign, 1972, uh, when we won. When you were shocked. Well, when uh, you were shocked that you won. Yeah. When and uh, that was the best victory because you know what? Oh because there was a little sinister twist. All Democrats in Delaware had election nights in fire halls and with plastic forks and paper plates. <laughs> the Republicans were the elite, not elite, they were the, yeah, the more elegant, you know, we were, we were just fire halls. They had, there was one hotel in, in Wilmington, which is the best, it's a, a, the Hotel DuPont, it's a five-star hotel. The gold ballroom was where everybody of the important people got married or had their events. And it was where the Republican Party every year held their election results. And they had champagne glasses, and they had silver, and they had crystal, and it was magnificent. So we announced in March, and I went over in April to the Hotel DuPont, and I reserved the gold ballroom <laughs> for election night. <laughs> and they, the, no, the Republicans, for uh, as long as it had been there, I'm making it up, 50 years, 100, you know, whatever, they always had it. They just assumed it was theirs. So when they went to reserve it for election night in September, and they said, oh, sorry, sir, it's already been reserved. Biden has it. You could hear that roar throughout the city. <laughs> what the hell? And I said, yeah, hi. <laughs> and uh, that was the best satisfaction. And they had to bar the doors because so many, and then after that they said they'd never have another election night party because everybody came in. It was such an upset victory that then everybody in the state of Delaware had voted for us. And my brother believed it. And I said, that's why you have a sister, because I kept a book, and I know who didn't. <laughs> but he, you know, he's Mr. Friendly. I mean, he, he doesn't carry any grudges. I don't know what's wrong with him. <laughs> um, what, uh, what advice um, would you give to a woman in her 30s who tries to achieve her dreams? What would, and and you've, you've, you've touched on it, but um, what, what would you I, say? I don't know whether... There's a difference in her her twenties or thirties or forties. Um, I th again, I think that I, you have to to you have to reach and risk. You know, there's risk involved in in everything. And if you want to, uh, I'll talk in the world of politics. If you wanted to, but it applies to business and to law. You know, it's it's all the same. When you want to go for something, I think there are, there are three things that are really important. First of all, you have to, and, and I'll take it in the political field, okay? You have to, first thing you do is you have to have your personal life in order. And I'm not talking about, you know, CIA going through the trash can and, you know, all your secret codes. I'm talking about understanding where you are if you're in a relationship, if you've got aging parents, if you have young children, you know, you, when you go out and battle and work for what that reach is, that in my case, it's running for elective office, you know, you're, all day long you have incoming. When you come home, you have to have a place where it's home. And your spouse doesn't say, for God's sakes, it's 9 o'clock, I've had the three kids up, you know, I've given them dinner, they're in their bath, they're driving me crazy, where the hell have you been? Well, you've been out doing your job, whether it's been in the you know, headquarters, or political, or in your work, or preparing a case for for your loss for um, the court. So you got to get your personal life in order. The second thing is is you have to know what it's worth losing over, not what why you're going to win, what you why you want to win, but what's worth losing over. What won't you cross over? What won't you give? What, where's your principle? Where's, where's that stop? 
you know, it's a slippery slope when you start, you know, cutting off this and that. And the third thing is, is that I surround yourself with people who know more than you do in a particular area. But in the end, trust your gut. And you think because people are smarter, they have a bigger degree, you know, that they're smarter than you are? No, they're not. But you can't be a dummy. You ask all the questions and you find out as much as you can, but then trust your gut. Don't go against your gut. And there are the three things for a woman in her 30s or her 40s or her 50s, or I don't know much beyond that. <laughs> <laughs> if you ran another campaign, what issue do you think you would most want to focus on? Uh, well, I think that the, the biggest issue right now is uh, 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 climate change, uh, the, the planet Earth, because every, but, but the issue that is particularly, uh, I, I think, essential right now is, is voting rights. And we're going back to the old Jim Crow days where uh, you, we can't vote. I mean, the, the restrictions on voting and that as we have seen from our court decisions and our faith in our institutions and our individuals. And I'm not going to run, I, I'm never going to hang up my spikes, but um, I, I just put on my combat boots now. I don't want to run the campaign being in the headquarters like I always have been, you know, when getting the three o'clock call. I'm, I want to be out. There's lots of people who can run a campaign as well or better than I with all of the new technology, but there's nobody who can represent Joe better than I. Because, and Joe will say that. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's because it's like brothers, it's not like, it's brothers and sisters. I mean, it doesn't make me probably any different than you with your brothers and sisters. I mean, you know, the, I know the nature of the beast and I know 99.9% .9 what we get the same answer. His is by Jesuit logic, more, mine's more by instinct. He said, how the hell did you go there? You know, but he's, he, he is very uh, empathetic, which everybody knows but he's really whip smart. I, somebody said to me a while ago, a very short time ago, you know, they make fun of him because he stuttered when he was a kid. He couldn't string more than three words together. So he knows what it's like to be bullied and to be, you know, that bile sticks in your throat. And again, not unusual. I bet every one of you have been. You can remember that girl in high school or that, you know, we've all been there. But uh, I said to him, that, and sometimes you can still see it, hear it, like when he'll stumble over, or it's a stutter. And, uh, and I said, yeah, he, he, the wise remark, you know, he can't, you know, he can't string three words together. I said, yeah, you're right, he can't string three words together. He can only string NATO together. <laughs> the international community. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, what traits did your brother have as a child that that clearly were shined through that as an adult. I mean, it, what are I think is his empathy. Is his number one, uh, and that's because uh, uh, y you know adversity builds character uh, more than the spoils of a victory. And uh, I think it's the the very fact what was just so awful at the time to be made fun of, to, to be told, called stupid, to go you know get a, you know go. Joe, go there, you know, that's horrible. But because of that, you have a choice. Be my brother was, was determined that he was not gonna be defined by a bully, and he built a backbone of steel, little by little, as a little boy. And when you've been bullied, you, as you grow up, you have a choice. You can become a bully yourself, or you can realize we're all in this together. And he realized we're all in this together, and that with his intellect, has got him to where he is today. September. Did I answer the question? You did. Okay. You, did you did a fine job. Thank you. Um, September 23rd, 1987, Joe pulls out of the race in the middle of the, the Bork hearings. Mm -hmm. That was such an interesting chapter. Oh, yeah. 
And, and it, you, I mean, yes, it, an omission. It, it almost broke you. You say. Well, yeah, because it was a it was a character assassin. Joe took a hit at the. I I mean, again, you. He made a mistake, and he had to. <clears throat> he had to deal with it. He was at the Iowa State Fair twenty five times. So Iowa, we used the Kinnick speech again and again and again and again. And um, but at the end of this one. He didn't, and he walked off the stage. And our, it's our fault. Uh, the state director, Joe, said, "Jesus, you know, I, I, I didn't say Kinnick. And the, our team said, "You know, look, the entire, the, the, the whole press corps can repeat that by heart. You know, they know it's Kinnick, and just let's go." And so, with the, an omission um, of a of the tongue, slip of the tongue, he. Um, uh, he got nailed for not quoting, which he didn't. Well, I mean, which he he, he did, but, it. but he didn't it, attribute. Y yes, he didn't attribute that. But time. he had done it a hundred uh, like times. Like a yeah. hundred times. I mean, the press knew it. For, and then one of our the Democratic opponent who was primarying us. It was a time that they called the Seven Dwarfs. One of the Democratic opponents, the term was "drop the dime," on us like three weeks later. And said, you know, check out Biden. What he, what he did. He plagiarized, and which was so, which was ridiculous. So, uh, uh, but we had a we had a job to do, and Joe wanted to be president, but his job was to be the senator, and the senator he was chairing, the Judiciary Committee with Robert Bork, which is what we're talking about today in the Supreme Court and the right of privacy. Joe. Um, could go out and stay in Iowa or, and uh, continue, continue his, to rebuild his reputation, or he could go back in the hearing to try and defeat Judge Bork, which is the whole basis of keeping Roe v. Wade for the past 25 years. Uh, that's the Bork confirmation, uh, not, not selecting Bork uh, provided for that. So it was, I, th I thought it was, I, I took it a lot harder than Joe because it was that they went after Joe. It was so mean at it his was. for his character, and uh, and it was so that I thought was a really odd. But you know, look what look what happened. September 2013, we went back in, and I think a week later we defeated Bork, and and he went on, and he's where he is today. So you, but can you imagine anybody getting nailed for that today? And this, but again, I'm not. I'm not whining. I'm whining at the character assassination. I, I revolt at the character assassination. Not standing up if you, you know, if you get, if you're going to get smacked, you get smacked. Fast forward to February 1988, which was perhaps the scariest time of your existence with the aneurysm. Oh yeah, he ruined Valentine's Day. Yeah. Uh, uh, my brother had a, uh, during, during the campaign, he had had t terrible headaches, and, ne and he never took an aspirin. I mean, he was always healthy, and he, uh, it turns out that he had gone to Rochester to make a speech, and he came home, and um, well, his staff was with him when they went to get him the next morning. They, he was on the floor. Uh, and he had an, an aneurysm, which I never even knew how to pronounce the name. I didn't even know what it was. And, and uh, he didn't get on that plane. Remember? It, it, had he? Oh, well, that, oh, I see what you're doing. Yeah, what I put in the, sto the story, the moral of the story is my mother always said that, you know, behind every dark cloud there's a silver lining if you look hard enough. Well, if Joe had not resigned and gotten out of the race with Bork, in September 23rd, he would have been. He would have been at the very time that this aneurysm happened in February, where the that's where the primary was in Iowa and New Hampshire. So he would have been on the plane and the little plane in Iowa and New Hampshire, and that aneurysm wasn't didn't care if he was doing Bork or if he was in Iowa. <laughs> I mean, it happened when it happened, and he would be he would be dead because there's no place on a little plane in the winter in Iowa where you're going to get 
the care that he, he was in Wilmington, and we got him at Walter Reed Hospital. And that's where they, had, they literally did hundreds of aneurysms, this very serious kind of operation, as opposed to a doctor in nowhere in I, Carroll, Iowa. I'm just making up a name, you know, who's never seen an aneurysm before. So my mom was right. Um, out of what was a terrible thing at the time, he lived, saved his life. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you. I've, I, I, it took me a little while to put it together. <laughs> it's in the book. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I mean, are we finished? You know, I well, have all night. I, no. I was, I was just, I was just told the, yeah. uh, that you had one last question, and I asked the last question because okay. I behave. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to go put vodka in this. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm sorry. I know you rearranged your life. This was scheduled in the very beginning, and I had to go get COVID. And um, well, I said, I was telling Washington, the, the book dropped on a Tuesday, and there's a, a whole run-up, which you are all the run-up to the book. Washington, Wilmington, Philadelphia, Colbert, Anderson Cooper, the 92nd Street Y, Seattle, and San Francisco all came down. And boy, I, the, that's when the, I was really sad. And I, because I wrote a book, and if you, you know, if you write a book, I wanted it to be a bestseller. And I thought that this was really rotten tomatoes. But I, anyway, I, I've given up the title of First Sister, and I prefer to be called New York Times bestseller instead, <laughs> author instead. Thank you. Thanks for coming tonight. <laughs>